today on the Perception in Action podcast. How can we make isolated at-home sports training more representative? A discussion with Ryan and Brett from Switched On Training. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book. Yes, I've written a new book on skill acquisition called How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. It covers the ecological approach to skill from different angles, including practice design, the CLA, coaching, youth sports, designing technology, injury prevention, and using analytics. So I hope you will consider giving it a read. You can find the book on Amazon or by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash book. Now on to the show. Okay, I think we're live. Welcome everyone to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. I'm pleased to be joined by Brett and Ryan, who's parts they work on today with the, the affiliate with the switched on which is a it's a training app that's being developed and what we want to do today is um talk a, kind of about the challenge of doing kind of represented training by yourself at home isolated in particular if you're on you're training for team sports right how do we how do we train by ourselves in a way that's going to transfer to team training so I'll preface this by saying, and Brett's going to show you that some of the demos. Um, one of the, on the surface, you know, if you follow me for a long time, this might look like something I rail against on on some of my podcasts, like a generalized cognitive training. Um, but I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to have Brett and Ryan on is because. Um, it's not. They've made a lot of efforts already to try to incorporate different uh, ecological representative ideas, and they're constantly pushing in that direction. And we'll talk about, you know, the uh, Ryan, as you just said, thinking about it in terms of a continuum of representativeness or ecological validity, right? Um, you know, we have, starting with the reality, we have to train by yourself. How, what can we do? So that's kind of where we want to go. So I'll let, maybe let you guys introduce yourself a little bit about your background and what you do. Uh, Brett, can you? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'll preface this by saying that I'm definitely very much still a student to these two. So like pretty novice to the area, but uh, my background is I, I graduated the degree in neuroscience and went on to pursue my dream, which was to play professional soccer. So I spent a lot of time training by myself, didn't really have a whole lot of resources available to me and eventually got the opportunity to play uh, in multiple different countries. So I was in England, Germany, Australia, I uh, got to train under a lot of very sophisticated and modern coaches in terms of the way that we're developing skills and improving our performance these days. And I just noticed a big problem with the fact that training by myself so much it, in general is so important, right? Like you only have so much time you can spend with a trainer and especially now where we're even more limited than what we used to be. And that there's like very basic characteristics of games that are missing in the individual training, which is Games are reactive. Uh, games are unpredictable. Um, there's this whole uh, other component of it that you can't really replicate by yourself. And that's when I was introduced to a type of training where it was uh, like a visual stimulus training that we were doing in Germany. And even though it wasn't perfectly representative of what we experienced during sports, it was something that incorporated a lot of these components that I felt was very important to being able to perform a high level. And um, that's kind of where I came up with the idea of, of creating switched on, which is, I don't know if you want me to go into it too much right now, but happy to give like a, a yeah, maybe we'll let's give, a, give Ryan a brief yeah, intro, yeah, then yeah. you can go in and you can Good. show us some don't stuff. Want, yeah. Don't no problem. <laughs> Before yeah. I also forget. <laughs> Not much thunder to steal, but, um, <laughs> my name is Ryan Glatt. I have a background in exercise science. Primarily. I was, a have been a personal trainer for about a little over 10 years. I started when I was about 17 illegally for the first year uh, <laughs> after uh, losing a lot of weight as a as a kid I was pretty overweight video game addicted what got me into fitness was exer gaming mm -hmm. uh, dance dance revolution the Nintendo Wii uh, and while those may not be uh, great sports training tools um, they really helped me to get more physically active and encourage my mood uh, they actually helped me recover from a, a, a pediatric concussion that I had as a kid oh, as really? well 
And so, uh, of course, there's a lot more evidence out now that extra gaming can play a role in enhancing cognition and increasing levels of physical activity in a variety of populations, specifically older adults and children, athletes, probably not so much. Um, and this kind of kick-started an interest in neuroscience, gaming, and movement, um, kind of popped around to different professions, body work, uh, pre-physical therapy, and I'm kind of a random person. I get into a lot of random scenarios. I worked <laughs> in West Africa for two years and uh, tried to go to physical therapy in Scotland, and that didn't work out, and eventually kind of landed in this interest in neuroscience. And I said, okay, as a, as a personal trainer, as a health coach, how can I help someone with their brain health and not just their hypertrophy or weight loss or pain management. Um, and so I started to dive into the literature on exercise and, and brain health. That sort of led me to the tangent of dual tasking and extra gaming. And um, flash forward a few years, I've been in the, I've had a master's in neuroscience uh, from King's College of, of London for about two years now. And I've been working at a place called the Pacific Brain Health Center for about four years where I run a medical fitness program called the Fit Brain Program, which is essentially a dual task exercise gym uh, or a brain gym, as we might like to call it, for older adults with cognitive concerns. Uh, but throughout all this process, one of the things that also got me very physically active and more social was tennis. Mm -hmm. And so I still have, even though I'm not the sportiest guy, I'd never grew up playing a lot of sports. I don't watch sports. I don't follow sports, but I love the science of sports. And so I'm, I'm interested in the translation of dual tasking and extra gaming, both clinical extra gaming, serious extra gaming into athletics um, and sports performance. And I came across Brett's app, Switched On Training app, um, and I'm extremely interested, as we'll talk about, the idea of remote training or home training or expanding dual tasking and extra gaming or perceptual cognitive motor training. We'll you know, negotiate the terminology um, into the home environment. Because you'll, as we know, there's a lot of coaches, uh, whether evidence-based or not, who are interested in this concept. And athletes are interested in this concept. And with any concept like exercise, for instance, how does it scale? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we'll draw a lot of parallels to connected in-home fitness. But uh, that's my background. And I have a strong interest in, in how neuroscience helps people, um, specifically as it applies to dual tasking, extra gaming, and the like. Mm -hmm. Cool. In in our terms, you sounds like you had a very nonlinear uh, path. To yeah, <laughs> yeah, lots myself. of variability. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, throwing all the buzzwords. Um, okay, so, yeah, thanks, guys. So yeah, maybe we'll go, Brett. If you want to take the screen a little bit, and um, we'll go back to. Yeah. So yeah, very simply, um, what Switched On is is it provides uh, different visual and audio stimuli. Uh, to make your training more reactive and cognitively demanding to um, attempt to better represent game-like scenarios. And also, as Ryan kind of alluded to, we work a lot with like uh, the aging population and just physical fitness as a way to improve both physical and cognitive uh, health and performance. So I can share my screen real quick, especially as it relates to like the sporting aspect is, um, one sec, let me see if I get this up. All right. Can you guys see this? Okay. Let me, I think I have to add it there. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah. If, so this, in this instance, uh, we're showing randomized arrows. So we have different cues like arrows, colors, numbers that you can manipulate to uh, make it more complex and do different types of drills with. But this is a very basic scenario that we're using with the soccer player. Um, I was a goalkeeper, so this isn't me. This is one of my friends, uh, Alex Ainscoff. And he's kind of representing a more reactive scenario where you are making a decision based off of what the cue shows on the phone. Um, so you get the ball, you make a decision, and then you actually complete the action. So we have different types of training programs on the app like this that are trying to represent more of what you'd experience during games by placing the phone where you'd be looking in games to use that your perceptual system as you would be, um, and then use different types of information to... Um, do multiple different things with it. So that's one example. And then this is another, which if you're a soccer player, you understand the importance of like scanning. So it's a huge topic now of how important it is to be able to know what's going on behind you. And this is a way to get that aspect where you're not just scanning and, you know, just looking at nothing here. You're actually uh, being forced to process information and make a decision based off of what that information is. So we have over 
30, 40 different sports people that are using it for, mostly like reactive sports or like team sports. Um, but also, like I said, too, it's like military, first responders, general fitness. And yeah, this is just a couple examples of how it's being used. Cool. Let me I'll go back to our <laughs> view. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Cool. Yeah. So you kind of the two two of the main big I know, features you I know you've tried to work on is the the position right. Of, you want to have the visual information kind of in the same getting people to look in the right place uh, like they would normally look, having it up mounted on a tripod and um, and then having them respond rather than touching the screen or, or something like that, having them do more active uh, responses. Is that kind of the two of the main things that you, that differentiate switch switched on? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We look at sort of the, the kind of 2d brain training space and where that started and it's, you know, sitting down in front of a screen, touching a screen in response to stimuli. And, you know, certainly the, the argument for ecological validity is out there and there's the, the famous lumosity, uh, you know, legal issues of overstepping their claims, but they're still in, a, uh, people are still embracing t- two dimensional brain training. Um, mm-hmm. just look at Tom Brady, uh, and his brand and he's partnered with brain HQ. Mm-hmm. And so one of the most prominent athletes <laughs> yeah. out there is still perpetuating this. And, you know, we're not going to say it doesn't help at all, but we'll all agree that it's not ecologically valid. Mm-hmm. Um, now the, the chance that it's, going to transfer is going to be less likely, but that's still out there to this day. And so the question is, is for us is not, how do we be the best solution? But we recognize that between 2D brain training on one end of the spectrum, probably representing the least ecologically valid and the most ecologically valid, let's say what very well structured, you know, principle based small sided games in team sports, for instance, with specifically design constraints being the other end of the ecological mm-hmm. validity spectrum, there is this big gap in the middle, uh, especially when you're on your own mm-hmm. within those training options. And how do you create some sense of constraints on your own? And as Brett showed, um, you know, it's one person with one phone in a game like environment with a game like tool trying to create a game like scenario. And that's not going to be perfect. It never will be, mm-hmm. but the, the ability to create some sort of constraints on your own in a randomized, unpredictable setting um, is something that Switched On does allow for, which I think whether it works or not is a great question, but we're trying to follow the principles of ecological validity and representativeness. Um, And in comparison to the aforementioned sort of 2D brain training, Mm -hmm. uh, it could be more beneficial, but more research is needed. Yeah, no, I I think there's there's some good points there, and I I have a I just thought of a relevant sort of maybe relevant story. So so I've been you know been getting back into the gym. I go to spin classes. I do all these things. So I have doing pretty good cardio. Um, yesterday, my wife and I played. We had a marathon game of pickleball for the first buyers, not doubles, singles. So and I was exhausted. <laughs> the uh, unpredictable re- movement. And having to speed up and decelerate, and I think it's just totally different than the scripted class, right? I, I think they're totally different things. It reminded me how much difference there is when you don't know. You have to decide, and you have to accelerate and stop and start, right? There's a, there's a. It feels like a totally different thing to me. It does this morning, definitely. Yeah, there's definitely a unique yeah. metabolic challenge yeah. between yeah. Uh, closed skills and open skills. Mm-hmm. The closed skill, of course, being the cycling class in this case. Yeah, and there, there may have been some unpredictability in that cycling class. You know, changing speeds mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. of that regard that you didn't expect, and that could be more cognitively demanding than just cycling for thirty minutes with no change. Um, so open skills and closed skills are also on a spectrum with ecological validity uh, or, or similarly to ecological validity. Um, but with the open skills like pickleball uh, or even the dual task exercise or reactive agility training that Brett was, has mm-hmm. been talking about and that switched on is primarily used for, um, those are more open skills. That unpredictability has a metabolic demand. Mm-hmm. But there was also a very interesting systematic review um, in younger adults showing that open skill exercise does improve certain cognitive abilities more than closed skill exercise, mm-hmm. more significantly than closed skill exercise. So um, there's also another uh, review on athletes with dual task training, uh, talking about the acute and chronic benefits and showing that 
the in the sh- in the acute phase, uh, dual tasking can can impair performance, and we know this because it creates a cognitive constraint. It's dual tasking. You're doing two things at once. It's not going to be as efficient. It's more cognitively demanding, more metabolically demanding as you experience. But then chronically, there seems to be improvements in in working memory, yeah. uh, and I believe attention. And so that that is an athlete. So there's some evidence to show that younger adults, such as yourself, Ra. I call you <laughs> yeah. Okay. Adult. Thanks. Accept, accept <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, and, and athletes can benefit cognitively from these types of interventions. Of course, there's never been a switched on study. Uh, I don't know if there's been a pickleball study, <laughs> but you know, it, it begs the question, will that transfer? Um, mm. And you know, if, if there's two ways of improving working memory, for instance, one via 2d brain games and uh, three, maybe the second one, maybe being, um, you know, open skill exercise, pickleball, Mm -hmm. any racket sport, for example. And then maybe the third example being something like switched on training. They all improve working memory, which are more likely to transfer those improvements in working memory, I think is an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so, you know, getting to the representativeness, there's kind of three principles I always think of when I action fidelity, you want the person to move in a way that's as similar as possible to the way they're going to move in their sport. So like you're showing like kicking the ball as a response instead of touching the screen as a response. Coupling and decision-making, you know, um, the big challenge though as in this, and I know you guys have thought about, is the information, right? Getting the athlete to act on the same information they're going to act on in the sport, which is a real challenge with this, right? Because the information comes from another person, right? And if you had another person with you, you would play with the other people, right? Instead of the, so Brett, can you talk a little bit about the stimuli that you, you've you used and, and that you're presenting to, to people um, to, to respond to on the app? Yeah, this is coming into it too. This is like one of the biggest things that I noticed as well. And like, there's never going to be something better than actually like playing your sport, Mm -hmm. right? Like I think a lot of people think that we're trying to replace, like I've had people reach out like, Oh, do I need to uh, go to my practices? Can't I just stay home and you switched on? It's like, no, you, you need to play your sport. This is just something to help uh, potentially make your individual training better. And in regards to the stimuli, yeah, there's very, like in those, I showed very basic things like arrows where it's a lot of uh, top-down processing. That's right, mm-hmm. Ryan. Top-down processing, where it's very like simple, uh, very reactive. But also, we have so colors. It would numbers, be more bottom up, bottom or up. bottom up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, using things that are more cognitively demanding. Um, so things like even if you had like numbers, instead of moving left or right to arrows, you can use even versus odd numbers, where it's, there is more like processing needed and more. Um, different actually cognitive skills me and Ryan talked a little bit about too, uh, being able to like try to target different areas, but depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but also trying to move towards things that are even more ecologically valid. So things like, um, uh, like the looming stimulus, I know you Mm -hmm. talked about a lot of really Mm -hmm. interesting studies with the looming stimulus, which if anybody doesn't know, it's essentially like a circle and correct me if I'm wrong too, because (laughs) you actually introduced me, but uh, (laughs) it's like a circle that gets bigger, which better represents um, something coming at you. And they did a study on, I think it was infants where uh, they showed this and the infant would flinch Mm -hmm. uh, kind of showing that they did uh, something was coming at them or it kind of represented this. So trying to do things that we can fit onto a phone screen or an iPad screen, which is kind of the challenge, but being able to do it in, uh, ways that either better represents sports specific situations like the looming stimulus or is even just more cognitively demanding and potentially targets different uh, areas of the brain, which I think Ryan has a lot of really cool information on too, if you want to touch on that. Yeah, Ryan. Um, yeah. Do you want to? Ryan, did you want to? Uh, Sorry. So the question <laughs> being. Uh... No, yeah. I'm sorry, Brett. What was the specific question? Yeah, just about um, what we would talk about where it's um, using different stimuli to almost act as ways to target different cognitive skills. Uh, so, for instance, if you're reacting to an arrow going in a certain direction, potentially oh, sure. reacting to the opposite direction of an arrow could be better for something like impulse control. Potentially, yeah. And we, we have this concept of, of you know top-down versus bottom-up. I think most researchers would agree that um, – you know, if we're going to train cognitive skills, of course, there's processing speed training and executive functions and 
processing speed and reaction time is probably more bottom up, these simple reaction, especially when it's information that's already sort of understood, there's a relevance to it. And then top down is going to be synonymous with more uh, executive functioning, more complex cognitive processing. And sports is complex. And so, yes, there's reaction time, which is simple or could be simple. Um, but there, there's sort of this concept that the processing speed based cognitive training is less likely to transfer than more top down as challenging executive functions and things like that, because sports more consist of those complex executive functions uh, than just bottom up training. I think both are important. And there's re research showing that, you know, athletes that perform at a high level ha already have elevated cognitive abilities in all of those domains mm -hmm. for the most part. And so the, the question then becomes, are you just having someone who's already good at this demonstrating that they're also good at something else uh, mm -hmm. or not and, and saying, oh, by improving executive functions, does that transfer? So the transfer conversation still lives on in that argument. But the idea is that we're inspired by cognitive training, uh, which does take a domain specific approach. If you were to download a brain game, there's attention games, there's memory games, there's processing speed games. And while we think there are issues with that approach, um, especially when there's research coming out showing this variability approach might improve transfer or help improve cognition more significantly than just domain specific training exclusively. We do want to uh, approach this like we would with muscle group training, where we know that cognition is integrated, but there, is, there might be some value in addressing specific domains. And I think the, this, there's a double-edged sword to this cognitive complexity. Mm -hmm. On one hand, you create the argument that you're just not reacting to a piece of information whether or not it's relevant to the sport. We know that an arrow is not mm -hmm. uh, specifically, but you're, you're just responding left if, it's, if it shows left. That's quite simple. Um, now, if we wanted to have more complex information, we could have a Stroop kind of effect where the left arrow is on a, a red screen background, and that means I'm going to the right, but I'm initiating that with my right foot because red means right. And mm -hmm. we could say that's good because it's more complex right? We're at least getting the athlete to think more and it's not as bottom up. The problem is that's probably more abstract than what you started with. And we don't have enough research to determine this, but could that be harmful in certain instances? Could we be uh, get uh, not really understanding that, that information action coupling and being so abstract that we get further and further away from what would be representative of that information action coupling. Mm -hmm. However, uh, with where the technology is at with a phone, uh, it's either displaying information in this way or augmented reality or audio training. And in kind of playing with those three different options, this visual stimulus, regardless of, of its abstraction, uh, is, is kind of one of the best options, in my opinion, because the next step up is virtual reality, uh, assuming that we're on your own and you cannot mm. play with a team yeah. at home, right? Yeah. And it has to remain somewhat affordable. The next step up above that is virtual reality or augmented reality or just extended reality. And the step below that is sort of these pre-planned imagined drills. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of my explanation of the cognitive domain specificity. It's like taking your training and making it more specific to an outcome or a muscle group or a skill set. And I think the challenge is people understanding cognition, but then even if you know the definition of mm -hmm. executive functioning and working memory as an athlete or a coach, it's like, how do you then determine what's potentially more authentic information action coupling than something else? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a key point. Like, you know, of course you'd like to do it a certain way, but this is, you know, the reality that you have to deal with of, of in-home training. And, and I think, you know, some of the ideas, you know, obviously the, the kind of th approach I take are different to executive control and things like that. But I think there's some uh, fundamental similarities. Like another one, I think, I don't know if you guys have this built in where you a person has to inhibit a response. So is there kind of a, do you have like a go, no go kind of where oh, yeah. there's so yeah, on we some with a lot of go, no go. Absolutely. So, Especially when we're changing the context of the rules. Uh, we add in, you know, this, the classic go, no go is, you know, green for go red for stop. Mm -hmm. And so switched on, you know, incorporates arrows, colors, numbers. Uh, but then there's a, a new feature in which there's complex stimulus where you can have arrows with a colored background. And so inherently with that design, we can incorporate more go, no go, Stroopy like concepts 
Um, so yeah, I think there's quite a lot of go, no go within, a, uh, much of the task design that we recommend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think they'll also, the, the challenge with these to me is, you know, what are you trying to develop? Like, um, you know, are you trying to develop a skill that you can plug into soccer later <laughs> or are you trying to do training, you know, keep your fitness level up in a way that's, you know, engaging, you know, so there's various kind of ways you can think about this. I think, um, you know, the information one, I think, you know, the, the, the big challenge is getting, using something you don't have to kind of abstract the rule out of, right. You don't play soccer by going left when it's green, you know, that's a fundamental or by an arrow, but, but trying to build from that to the actual information, right, is a, is a challenge. So, so I think those are the, you know, we, we have to kind of try to push the envelope with this, like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, I know Brett sees switched on applications. It's very broad. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different applications for switched on from, from Brett's perspective. And, and Brett, I'd love to hear you talk about that. My, my perspective on switched on where it fits really, really well is within reactive agility, where we look at agility training, which has its own sort of uh, criticisms. But one of the criticisms is that it's Mm -hmm. pre-planned. A lot of agility drills are pre-planned. Sure, a lot of the the tools that are utilized are not representative because you don't see those tools on the field. Uh, You're often looking down at your feet and there's pre-planning. So those are just some examples of the problems with agility. But I think uh, agility is something that athletes feel they can and should work on on their own, whether or not it helps is a, is a different discussion, but being able to put yourself at eye level and not look at your feet, have some sort of uh, spatial constraints with cones or dots or hurdles and things of that regard, speed ladders, and then being able to associate different sport-like patterns or game-like patterns of movement Ideally, in a game-like scenario, recognizing not everyone can get a soccer field to themselves yeah. uh, or, or similarly, and, and being able to have this, this phone at eye level and change the agility from pre-planned to reactive. And within that reactive agility, having some variety, having mm-hmm. some variability of, of cognitive load, cognitive domain specificity, perhaps, that's where I see the real value. And even though there's not a whole lot of research on just reactive agility. And even if there's a few papers, reactive agility using this, this framework, um, it does seem to follow some of the principles of ecological validity. And it's slightly more representative than if we just did pre-planned agility. So that's sort of our argument. And if uh, we're sort of meeting in the middle, because mm-hmm. once again, if we had brain games over on one end of the spectrum, and we had small-sided games on the other end, we are trying to literally meet in the middle of that continuum to say we're not the best, but we are an option for training on your own within this concept of reactive agility. That's the way I see it. Brett, why don't you talk about some of the other applications you see? Yeah, just to touch a little bit more on that too. I feel like it is another uh, another issue more with semantics because agility in my perspective is very much like you are by yourself or you're you're performing a physical movement and i see like almost skill as something that's perceived different um where it's basically agility that involves some sort of sports uh equipment so for instance soccer is a great one where uh, dribbling a soccer ball is a very difficult skill to do within itself and adding some sort of stimulus to that to make it more reactive to better represent sports that's where um you could you could essentially call that the same thing as agility though couldn't you like a, a gross full body movement it's just incorporated in response sort of, to a stimulus in response and to so a stimulus. yeah mm-hmm. if you're if you're practicing and rob feel, being the professor <laughs> correct me if, I'm wrong, but, um, if you're if you're dribbling a basketball and you're learning skills within that um at first most people just do it on their own but mm-hmm. eventually they're doing that in response to another person which would be the stimulus in this case yeah um, my big thing with agility ag- agility to me has a purpose right I go left because you're coming at my right. Like I go left to get away from you, right? When you put a cone on the ground, you've lost all the purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Why would I go left? Because the coach said, start going left. Right? There's no purpose in and of itself. Um, so I think you're definitely, you're, you're giving a bit more reason because of the, the kind of the game-like. Um, it's still not 
the same purpose as, right? There's no reason to go left per se, other than the arrows, arrows pointing left. Like you're not trying to get away. But that, that's, again, the same problem of having um, someone, in, you need someone there, right? If, if you want right. that, that functional purpose. So, so yeah, I, that's the way I think of agility. But I, I definitely, I think it's, it's, it's a solve some of the main problems with people compa- complain about ladders, agility ladders and cones, looking down, uh, all planned movements. Like I think the unpredictable movements is there's some really growing body of work showing the importance of having that in practice, both from skill perspective and injury prevention, right? Mm. Everything in practice is so predictable, but we get hurt during unpredictable. <laughs> so we need to get our body ready to handle. Oh, you suddenly told me to go left when I thought yeah. I was going right, right? That's a really valuable. I think if you do it in the yeah. right way. Yeah. Yeah, so that that kind of yeah, it kind of sums up like the agility sports kind of uh, application of it. And the other one I was going to talk about was uh, rehabilitation. And uh, I like to think a lot about like the research dealing with external focus. Um, some of it's in terms of like cueing, so mm-hmm. cueing things ex- uh, with your external focus, but also just like uh, focusing externally while you're in the rehabilitation process to um, be able to get a reactive environment without actually being thrown right back into your sport right like you need to get used to this variability while you're returning from sports um so being able to use switched on is something that can give you that uh, before actually going back into your sport that's where i see another application of it um which i know you got to talk a little bit about too yeah and i think some of the like the tasks ryan i would add the ryan was talking about you know doing the number task or or stoop task and Mm -hmm. for me you know, I could see some value in those. They're almost like the reverse of occlusion in a way. They're they're making you keep your eyes up. Hmm. Not because the task is inherently something you're going to do in the sport or useful, but it's making you keep your eyes there. Um, the example, I you know, I think it's Barry Bonds used to do a drill by himself where he'd hit uh, tennis balls, I think, projected where he wrote numbers on them. <laughs> and, and he had to read the numbers while he was hitting. And obviously, that's not something he ever has to do in baseball, but it makes him keep his eye on the ball longer and pick it up earlier, right? So it's achieving, although obviously you'd prefer them to pick up the actual information, getting them to keep their gaze in the right place and anchor it, you know, maybe that's useful in and of itself, even if it's not picking up the same information. Yeah, maybe it's not the the cognitive task itself, Mm -hmm. where if it's a working memory task, maybe the goal isn't to improve working memory Maybe it's just to incorporate something cognitively demanding enough to keep that athlete's attention, um, which attention economy, <laughs> right? I, I know I need to keep my attention. That's why I liked extra gaming is because it was something that kept my attention. And so even if it Im- ends up improving just attention and not working memory, even though it was a working memory task of some kind or a scanning task of some kind, I agree. I think keeping someone's attention with having some unpredictability behind it, which that's an element of gamification. It's an element of sports. It's an element of the real world, I think is incredibly important. And I think it's something that people don't incorporate uh, into their training often enough. Yeah. I was going to ask you about this, Rob, too, when you were talking about getting back into pickleball. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's something that like that you noticed too. It's like the engagement factor of like Mm -hmm. being involved into something and not just thinking internally about what you're doing and maybe how you don't like doing whatever you're doing. It's more like you're focused on something externally and, and responding that, um, I think is really important just for for fitness and keeping people healthy in general. Yeah, for sure. Instead of like playing, sitting there and playing with the ball, keeping it up in the air, <laughs> like uh, or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I think I think there's definitely um, it's way more fun, and you know, um, you know, you get like a kind of a you could strategy component in it too. If you you know you have to. So yeah, I, I agree. I think um, you know there's some definite ways it kind of steps up things. Um, when you have these kind of responses. Yeah. And Rob, just going back to your example of, you know, ideally agility is trained within the context of reacting to relevant information, typically Mm. being a person. Um, You know, that is the the stimulus. The stimulus is ideally the person. And let's say you're going to be a soccer player. You're cutting left in response to a person coming at you. Um, If that person, and ideally we train with another person there, but if you were by yourself and you wanted to train that specific skill, how would we attempt to address it without technology? Yeah. Are there any ideas that you would have for that? 
Yeah, that, that's it. That's a great question, Ryan. It, it's a, it, it's a challenge. I I think I would go. Yeah, you know, I think I've talked about with you guys about this before. I sometimes separate skill and capacity. Right, like capacity is for me is like strength and flexibility and speed. Um, I think you, you, by yourself you can develop those so that when you get in the situation where you're actually in the game, it gives you more opportunities. Right. Um, you know, they, I, in tennis, like Nadal, when, I, when if I'm pickleball, <laughs> you go, go up to the real sports. A lot of people <laughs> consider <laughs> that don't like pickleball. Tennis, like Nadal can run around and hit a forehand, whereas I have to play a backhand because he has more capacity. It gives him more options. more. So it's not, it's not the actual skill itself, but when you get into actually the specific skill training, you have more these capacities. So I think doing kind of... If you can do, you know, acceleration cutting in a very realistic way, like it's almost more strength and conditioning training than skill training, I would call it. Um, I think it could. That's what I would focus on if I if I had to. I couldn't get any other way. So, uh, essentially, training uh, physical conditioning skills like cutting and acceleration, deceleration, in a capacity yeah. sense. Yeah, that's what I think. You know. Um, it is really hard to to recreate the the functionality of agility without right the, the, in my book and I always talk about tag like that's kids figured out how you develop agility you play tag right <laughs> you get away from someone you get attack you know it's very coupled information driven um, but I think so that that's what I would focus on and then I think some of your ideas like I know we talked about the looming one um, I think. Um, I also, I think we talked about the idea of like using biological motion stimuli. So mm -hmm. if people don't know, uh, biological motion is basically a dot point light display of another person, right? So it has all the dynamics of someone coming at you, the information. So trying to create those stimuli on the phone or tablet that has some of the same information, like looming, rather than a cue. So, you know, Gibson distinguished between a cue you have to learn. I have to learn yellow means left. I don't have to learn Learn looming's going to mean something going to hit me. It just tells me <laughs> uh, directly. So getting there, it's easier said than done, right, On in, outside the context. But I think I know you guys are thinking about some of those ideas for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And would you see something like, you know, working on cutting and acceleration, deceleration, the next step up could be a reactive version of that. It could be some sort of variability, a new set of constraints, perhaps a progression, a physical progression, understanding the metabolic challenges that come with that. Um, would you see that as, as valid to incorporate that? Yeah, I think like also any kind of variability. I know, um, I think, you know, it seems like you're would be right for adding variability, different coming at it from different angles, you know, get yourself really fatigued, then do these cutting drills, you know, having to adjust to the constraints that you can vary, um, starting positions, you know, um, you know, different so things like that i think would be you can add kind of variability um within the train yeah in constraints. in constraints yeah like you've talked about you know throwing different types of balls different weights different yeah. sizes different textures and that's sort of a a object-based constraint mm -hmm. and I, I think we could get better uh as a you know in rehabilitation fitness sports performance get better at understanding the cognitive constraints Mm -hmm. And we're just taking that same approach with perceptual cognitive stimuli, mm -hmm. where even though we know you're not hitting a wiffle ball mm -hmm. in tennis or mm -hmm. you're not hitting a ping pong ball <laughs> yeah. in baseball, the constraints approach for the either just for the mm -hmm. sake of variability or how that athlete self organizes around that abstract or novel stimulus might yield some benefit. Taking that sort of general approach to it, I think, could be helpful as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think adapting to the constraints of fatigue and things like that is not is something we don't give athletes enough practice at. You have to learn how to keep achieving your goal and move in a way that achieves the goal despite the fact you're fatigued or you're, you know, and I think doing something like this would be a great, you know, a great way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's where even uh, just like personally experiencing it when I was just starting to like prototype this and using this with like some of my friends. Uh, that's something that I noticed personally a lot is as you become more fatigued and you change the cognitive load that we're using, it's they're more likely to make these little errors and then start to get frustrated. And then 
so doing it as a as an option while you're fatigued is something that I always saw super interesting from the beginning. So mm-hmm. it's super cool to hear that brought up. Yeah. And then going with sort of the you you kind of manage what you measure. I, I don't think people measure. Uh, they're starting to measure fatigue uh, at the high level. I think mm. um, with wearables and how sleep plays a role and physiological markers, but cognition. How do you measure cognitive load? It's mm-hmm. just sort of assumed that, oh, it's something cognitively demanding. It's a reaction light, and that's good. But I think we need to take it a little bit uh, a step further. Um, everyone here is familiar with the rate of perceived exertion, either Bohr scale or just mm-hmm. scale of 0 to 10 or 1 to 10, 10 being the most physically uh, exhausting task, 1 being the least. There's also this scale called the NASA Task Load Index, mm-hmm. which is kind of – have you heard of this, Rob? Yeah, we use it a lot in human factors research. And that's yeah, the TLX. Exactly. Yeah. How frustrating so, is it? How physically demanding? Yeah. And how cognitively demanding is it? Yeah. It's just, so I'll, I'll borrow those Likert scales of uh, how do you perceive your performance? Are you frustrated? How cognitively demanding is this? How physically demanding is this? Overall, how, how demanding is this? And I'll just use it to get feedback and have the user shape the task. So we don't want it to be too frustrating unless that's the purpose you're trying to make mm-hmm. it frustrating. Uh, but but modifying that cognitive demand and in parallel with the psychological factors and in parallel with the physiological factors like physical load mm-hmm. and sort of having a trade-off where I believe if you were playing a brain game, it could be an 8 out of 10 cognitive load, 10 being the highest, but a 0 out of 10 physical load. So how, how do we maybe get it at a 7 to an 8, a 6 to an 8 and a 6 to 8? both on physical and cognitive, while also keeping frustration maybe at a six to an eight as well. You want it to be challenging, but not too challenging, sort of that flow state approach Mm -hmm. uh, where it's that balance of challenge and skills. And I think when we bring that in, a lot of coaches just use these reaction lights or perceptual cognitive motor training constructs to create, to illustrate how frustrating it can be rather than actually trying to apply it in a representative manner based on the users or the athlete's current set of abilities or their readiness for that time. Yeah. I, I think that's a, um, uh, I think that's a real area of potential we're kind of missing. I think for, for things like this, I, you know, I've worked with some teams where they have a some group of people collecting all this data on the player's sleep, their eating habits, and then they have practice data. How many shots did they miss? Did they struggle? And they never talk to each other. <laughs> like, I, I think this is a great, because, you know, all of us have, with you're using a phone, we all have these track, our, most of us track our sleep, how many steps we've walked, if you, you know, how those things interact, um, I think would be very useful information for a coach, right? Um, you know, I was talking, you know, uh, something like Peloton, you know, how, I don't, how, how do we know what activity we should suggest to you today? Right. Mm-hmm. I think we could be way more intelligent than, okay, you liked that one last time. Um, <laughs> did you not get enough sleep? You got three hours of sleep last night. Okay. Maybe you, you know, the last few ones, your heart rate was kind of high. You know, we have all this data. I think we could be very more, much more intelligent about how I we agree. prescribe training, yeah. how we periodize training and, and we don't really put it together, though, currently. <laughs> we all keep it all separately. Yeah. So, Brett, why don't you talk to Rob about maybe some of the ways we've approached periodization with this? Uh, so this, this is kind of referring to, like, the, um, the graph that you created with, like, high cognitive, high physical, and, like, the periodization. Through well, that, that would be progr- uh, programming for both mm-hmm. progressions and regressions, but specifically, you know, on-season versus off-season. Maybe what teams are using switched on for at what periods of time are they doing it before or after strength and conditioning? Um, what are some people doing with this in terms of when they're using it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty wide, but like some of the trends that we're typically seeing are we see a lot with like activation. So a lot of times people are using it as a way to like get um, primed for their training session or for their games as some like quick way to like activate themselves both physically and mentally and the other one, the main one is um, that you're talking about like when fatigue. So I see a lot of people using this like during their conditioning. I was actually just talking to a strength and conditioning coach who was talking about um, he, he would typically have them doing like sprints or something where they get fatigued. And then afterwards, try to do some sort of skill based training where it's like juggling or like something 
uh, just like small toe taps talking about soccer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he recently brought up to me, he's like, I want them to have something that's more representative that involves this mental component as well. So that's when he's using it a lot as well. So like while they're fatigued, give them 30 seconds of this sort of skill based training. And he talked a lot about too, like the, um, the idea of pressure, like trying to mimic that sort of feeling of pressure where you're in games and your heart's beating super fast because you're either tired or you're just very nervous and being able to perform under those conditions. So yeah. those are two of like the main ways I've been seeing. Yeah. I, I like the pressure one. I think there's tons of research showing the benefits of pressure, even if it's not anything like the actual pressure of, you know, hitting a putt to win the masters, the, there's tons of benefits. So if you can put time pressure on people and gamify it, I think, I think, and there's, there's some good papers on using game design principles in training. I think, I think that's another area. So, yeah. Yeah. Gamification, I think is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is when people don't take the principles of gamification, they say it's good because gamification Mm -hmm. and that they're, they're not looking into the science. Um, and, and I think, you know, you brought up Peloton. Peloton's actually getting into gaming now. I don't know mm-hmm. if you knew that. Yeah. They're designing mm-hmm. a rhythm game mm-hmm. to try to engage people a little bit more. I think the gamification has a couple different different elements. There's the intelligent recommendation of certain activities that are gamified. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the challenge with those companies right now is that, one, they probably just want to move units and get people to stay encouraged. And preferences isn't a bad way to dis- to, dis- to decision these tr- Decision, decision, decision tree. Yeah. God, man. Yeah. One cold brew is not enough. Um, <laughs> get those things out and and be able to recommend things. But I think the problem, and we've had this problem, is that if we made those decision trees, you almost run out of content. The mm-hmm. more specific you are, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you just end up with one class for one activity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's another problem that's very real. Is you just have to put out enough content to keep engagement. And the more intelligence behind it, the less options a user actually ends up with. So that's one problem. And then another problem with these technologies is just price. I mean, Mm -hmm. Peloton's $1,500 at the least, I believe. Yeah. Um, Unless you're just bumming to use one off somebody. And then you have the Oculus Quest 2, which is going to be about $300. Um, And there's only, you know, maybe a couple apps that I can think about. Yeah that then charge, you know, 40, 30 to $50 memberships per month on top of that. So this becomes very expensive for athletes. Um, Hopefully it'll become less expensive and it has been, but I think kind of cell phone based technologies or mobile based technologies are really a way to scale this at first. And that's what I love about what switched on is doing is trying to increase accessibility offer. Brett, I think you have some inner city programs utilizing this as well, Mm -hmm. which is kind of like, completely novel for any sports technology to penetrate that sort of social. Yeah. Um, even like, I mean, it's been over, used in over 200 countries and we've talked to people in Africa who have been using it as a way to, to train more effectively by themselves in an accessible way. And one more thing on like the decision tree stuff that's been really interesting to me is I don't know exactly what data it would be, but instead of subjective data where you're saying I am a soccer player who's eight to eighteen who wants to X, Y, and Z, having using some of that hard data even from your uh, your Apple Watch or even using some like the camera technology that we've been talking about to provide hard data that actually suggests uh, different difficulties of drills and things that are tailored to you, and then creating those progressions over time. Uh, I know it's something that we've talked about that I'm not sure exactly what that data is, but it's something that we've been looking into a lot and hopefully we could collaborate together and, and find some things that we could use for that. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. One of the reasons I want to have you guys on, I think you, 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 I like your dynamic evolving approach to a lot of these products. Like you meant you like people just develop something. Here's my science page with an article about brain plasticity and gamification, right? You're right. And then there's the evidence and then they just stop. Right. Whereas, you know, obviously the, our understanding of all these things is devolving. So I think we have to keep pushing it. So yeah, no, I think those are some great, great ideas. I gotta, I gotta wrap this up. Unfortunately, guys, I got a, another, I'm doing, um, I'm continuing on my book to where of it, doing interviews right. with other people. So I got another one coming up in a few minutes. So um, can you tell us, Brett or Ryan, a little bit where to go to find out more about um, what you guys are doing? 
Uh, yeah, so you can find us. Uh, you go to our website. I'm definitely working on getting the domain shortened. It is switchedontrainingapp.com. Uh, or or you can go to any, yeah. Yeah, any of our social media pages. It's at Switched On Training. Okay. Uh, you can reach out to me, Brett, at switchedon.com. I'm, I always love collaborating with anybody mm-hmm. who can help make a better product and help us create something that can help more people. So always looking to collaborate with as many people as possible. And I know Ryan's got an awesome thing he's doing over there. Uh, if you want to tell him about that. Yeah. So uh, you can find me uh, on Instagram at glatt, G-L-A-T-T dot brain health. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our, our center where we do some clinical research, uh, it's the Pacific Brain Health Center. So pacificbrainhealth.org. And then I also have a continuing education course for fitness professionals on brain health and how to create uh, exercise programs to prevent cognitive decline in older adults. And so it's not for athletes mm-hmm. specifically, uh, but we've actually had several coaches take it just to learn the basics of neuroscience because a lot of that is assumed and not really taught in, in basic exercise science graduate or undergraduate programs or their coaching programs. And so we've had a lot of coaches sign up just to learn neuroscience basics and the, the science behind exercise and brain health. Um, and so if you want to learn more about that, you can go to brainhealthtrainer.com. I would also have a shorter domain, but unfortunately the brain training <laughs> I <bet>. is stolen, <laughs> brain <laughs> fitness, brain gym stuff. So that was the only option I had. So yeah. also want to take a second to thank you, Rob, because ever since coming up upon your podcast, learned so much from it and I'm just honored to be on here and, and getting to talk with you guys. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, thanks both same. of you. That was fun. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakeAways. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away. Now you're the winter.